Okay, hey, welcome back to VMworld 2012. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley. I'm showing with Dave Vellante, co-host of theCUBE. And we have a special guest, Jerry Chen, uh, enterprise venture capitalist at Greylock, tier one VC. Uh, the best in the, one of the best in the valley. Some say the best in the valley, certainly on the consumer deals. I know about, you know, about Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn. You got Workday. You have, I mean, a zillion of successful. Facebook, David Z. I mean, just a, you know, Tumblr, huge success and huge success on the enterprise, Jerry Chen, former VMware employee, so very timely of the 10 year anniversary. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. Thanks so, for having so me. So one, you're now a VC at Greylock as, as a general partner or partner, managing yep. director, general partner, what do you call it? What I you? think we just go by partner, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> and you're at VMware, so first I got to ask you, 10 years yeah. anniversary of VMworld, what's your take on that? I mean, where's it come from? And what's your, are you blown away by the size? Tell us some of your best stories. I think what blows me away, I've been to every single VMworld, both in the US and Europe. I remember the first one in San Diego, I was literally uh, a new product manager setting up chairs in the back of the room <laughs> for awesome. the keynote, <laughs> right? And then even the 10th one, I'm still setting up chairs in the back of the room, they're just more chairs. Uh, I think the thing that blows me away is the ecosystem. That first VMworld in San Diego, we had a ballroom and hotel with maybe eight booths. And now we're just talking, the, the, it's a show within the show, right? It's not just what happens here, but the parties, the events, the, the suites that are booked in the hotels for like product launches, it just, it blows me in my, my mind, like kind of that, that shadow economy, that shadow conference that has sprung up around VMworld. And Oracle's, Oracle's on notice. I mean, they shut the streets down soon. Next year, if they stay in San Francisco, VMworld's going to have to shut the streets down. I mean, 23,000 people yeah. is the number, around the number there. Amazing, so good run for VMware, sure. right? So, so obviously VMware, there's a little VMware mafia going on. Uh, the which v was penned, the, v -mafia, the yes. v mafia, it was mafia. pointed out by Business Insider. Uh, we know uh, Eli Collins at Cloudera when I was in the office yep. there with, with those guys. He's, he's, he's out in there, you're out as a VC. So obviously VMware is that next generation enabler. You know, sure. starting out as a simple product in the enterprise, growing into a huge infrastructure opportunity, pivotal now out there. You're out doing enterprise deals. So first, tell the folks out there about Greylock's enterprise strategy. You guys sure. are a good team. Um, Anil Bushri, yourself, Joseph, uh, Ashim. Yep. Talk about Greylock a little bit and then we'll, we'll get into some uh, questions around what's going on. So Greylock's just been a great place to be as an enterprise investor. They've kind of pioneered this, this move towards the cloud with uh, you know, category defining comes like a Workday that's really pioneering um, ERP in the cloud. Uh, Cloudera that owns kind of the big data space around Hadoop, and then like a bunch of new great companies like um, AppDynamics in the APM space or um, Sumo Logic Log Analysis. So what these guys have done the past few years is really find these great secular trends or these great technology waves from you know client server to cloud, from cloud to big data, and really kind of make the right bets with great teams. And so. I just feel really lucky to be part of the team. I mean, that pedigree is pretty interesting. And one of the themes here in theCUBE, and to come back to that point, is the modern era of, of computing, the cloud era, not sure. to be confused with the cloud era. <laughs> um, but it, it, this, is, this is a whole new generation where applications are driving it, where infrastructure has to be assembled and you know, runtime assembly of infrastructure based on the demands. But if you look at uh, Facebook, you look at yeah. LinkedIn, these are applications that built their own infrastructure initially yep. and redefine the configuration of storage uh, and, and all the networking stuff. And, and they see the future of hyperscale. They lived it, they sure. built it. So now you're going to, you, you've had all that DNA in, in Greylock and, and you also lived it on the VMware side. So what is the thesis for uh, your investments? I mean, what are you looking at? What does Greylock uh, look at as a signal of a good deal? And what are the, sure. the hot, hot bets? I think you know, there's two ways to look at it. One, there's always team, and then secondly, is technology trends we're looking at. So first and foremost is finding great entrepreneurs, great engineers. I, I think walking the halls at a, a VMworld, there, there are startups, there's entrepreneurs, there are great technologists, so number one is find some great talent, great engineers to work with. Number two is kind of find these large thematic trends, and the key is always to ride a, a wave more powerful than you, right? So if you're fighting Google or your Facebook, you ride the social wave. 
when you're thinking about uh, technology enterprise investing, you look at what's happening with this cloud generation, and you kind of see what wave or what technology trend can I wait, ride that's going to be bigger than the incumbents that kind of carry my startup going forward. And so there are two or three we look at. One's around you know, this trend to mobile. Number two is this trend to what we call this post-server era of, of computing. Not just post-PC, but also post-server. And third is kind of this, this use of data, and not necessarily big data, but data science to build next generation applications. Yeah, so that post-server is interesting, right? Because I mean, VMware in many ways obliterated the sort of client-server sure. model. Um, I wonder if I could ask you, you, know, you talked about the ecosystem before, Jerry, before we get deeper into the, you know, the, the opportunities that you see. VMware's walking a fine line up with that ecosystem now. Do you sure. feel like, you know, I know you spent nine years there, you know, setting up chairs in the early days. Do you feel like the allure of monopolistic-like mar margins and behavior will not drag you know, VMware into to bad behavior, and it will still focus, you know, Todd Nielsen, when he was on theCUBE, would always say, you know, for every dollar spent on VMware licenses, I think it was up to 15 or 16 last time we had him on, John, and spent on the, on the ecosystem. Yeah. Do you feel as though they've got that balance, I mean, just both culturally and, and from a strategic standpoint? Um, you know, I, I think you got to pick your battles, right? So for sure, culturally, strategically, VMware knows that its key success historically has been that neutral, technology that kind of bridges multiple vendors on the hypervisor side, multiple vendors on the storage side, multiple vendors on the compute side. So uh, they know that's kind of the key to their success. But secondly, as you look for new areas of growth, you have to figure out are there new markets I need to enter or start, or categories I need to create, or are there existing markets or categories that I'm going to move into that start to tread on my ecosystem's toes. And I think trying to decide new markets versus existing markets is always kind of the dilemma of any management team. And you know they kind of go back and forth in different spaces where they say, hey, we're going to add new categories here. B, we're going to start adding value here that may start to overlap with our, our partners. But hopefully what they try to do is um, the philosophy is rising tide will float all the boats. If VMware can create a larger footprint in the data center, these partners can find other ways to add value, other products to sell, right? And I think that that's that level of competition forces everyone, VMware included, to be more innovative. And now as a venture capitalist at Greylock, I'm looking for opportunities to kind of um, capitalize on those trends. Areas that VMware is, is adding or areas they're, they're leaving behind, we're looking for startups to try to invest in, in this white space. So, you know, you talked about the, the big waves, the big four, cloud, mobile, social, big data. And on the one hand, you have an advantage in the enterprise of being able to see them emerge in the, the consumer side. Sure. At the same time, you've got to apply them into the enterprise, which is not always easy. John and I were talking about, just, just earlier today and yesterday, a lot of VCs just have tr struggle with sort of mapping, doing that mapping. Um, yeah. and <laughs> why? Or, their, or their herd mentality, right? I mean, there's two dynamics, right? Yeah, well, the industry in general. So, what gives you, you know, confidence? How do you, you know, squint through all that sure. noise? And, 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 and what are you seeing there in terms of people doing a good job? Sure, to, to borrow the phrase you said earlier, separating the signal from the noise, <laughs> right? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. so there's a lot of noise, a lot of static, and they say consumerization of IT or consumerizing enterprise. And in one extreme you say, what does that mean, like sticker packs for the enterprise? I don't, you know, it's <laughs> being thoughtful about what technologies matter and what use case. So in enterprise investing or enterprise startups, you do one of two things, cut costs or add revenue. Right, and if you find a product or find technology that can do both of those in spades, you have real value add. And so I look at that lens: Are you helping reduce costs or helping to add more value, generate more revenue, um, regardless of the technology or, or, or the theme? Then I think that's that's grounds for a good investment. I mean, people talk about uh, two themes: either A, trying to make Amazon look more enterprise-like, or B, trying to make the enterprise look more Amazon-like, right, more consumer-like. Uh, I, I think it's always someplace in between, right? There, there's a whole set of, set of ideas around how to take VMware or legacy enterprise technologies and make it look more consumer-ish, or how to take um, this public cloud writ large, Rackspace, Amazon, whoever, and apply private security to it to make it actually more attractable to an enterprise company. And like all things, the truth is going to be in between, and that's kind of um, the sweet spot. When I was in college in the 80s, one of the things that um, we, we looked at and, and just observed, 
back then I didn't even know what venture capital was, but we knew what a PC was. And it was sure. a huge Winchester disk drive bubble <laughs> back in the day. And Dave and I are old enough to remember you're that. Yeah, you're too young. You know, hey. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's all you need. Know, 10 meg hard drive was a revolution in the PC business. I got some stories there we can talk but about. But now fun. with Flash, yeah. Everyone's talking storage. So software-defined networking, yeah. Nasira was sold to VMware. Obviously that, that opened up the software-defined yeah. fill in the blank. Storage, networking, compute, that converged infrastructure picture. Uh, is there a bubble going on in your mind relative to Flash, like a Winchester analogy? And where is the enabler? Where is the disruptive enabler in this massive inflection point that we're living? What, what, where is that, what is that enabler? In every, sure. in every one, there's always one. It was TCP IP for yep. networking. You know, you pick your trend, there's always that one and disruptive enabler. Is there a disruptive enabler or our driver, right, that's kind of forcing this inflection point? So I think the enabler in storage has always been you know, the beneficiary of, of Moore's Law or the equivalent of hard drive is that cost of, of storage going down you know, year after year after year. So you saw what disk did to tape. And now you see what Flash is doing to disk because of Moore's Law, Flash is getting cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. Layer on software, so Pure Storage is a Greylock portfolio company that takes Flash storage arrays, lays on a level of uh, intelligent software to make the cost even more compelling. So, one, that makes the economics interesting, John, but the question is, what's driving that move towards adopting new technology is not just because it's cheaper, it's new applications. So specifically, it's when, when you use flash storage, that speed and performance is ridiculous. Remember when you went from flipping out your floppy drives, five and a quarter, three and a half, I'm not that young, I just look it, to, <laughs> for a hard drive where everything's really fast, to like um, optical where you actually had tons of data on kind of a, a, a CD um, media, once you move to Flash, the speed of your application, the speed of your database, um, it's incredible. And so our users now, they expect like no latency, right? Instantaneous photos, instantaneous um, data retrieval. That kind of experience is driving this move towards Flash, right? So I think the next gen is, okay, speed matters, speed's a better experience. Now, what kind of technologies or what kind of applications need that kind of speed? That means, do I need to rewrite my database server? Do I need to rewrite my application? Do I need to rewrite how I think about scaling my application out in this world where it's all flash? And so that's, I, I think, is so the next And that trend. is a, a cut cost and increased revenue play, and it's a huge market, sure. um, but it does feel a little bit overfunded, and, and it feels like the music's going to stop and there aren't enough seats, but, but maybe not. I mean, you know, Violin did its, did its you know, filed yesterday, and, and there's still a lot of growth potential left there. So, so, we, the, so we were talking about that, so I wonder if you get you know, Jerry's take on it. Maybe we're you know, out over our skis a little bit on that one, John, I don't know. And hey. you've got a portfolio company, so you're a little sure. biased on that, I know. Well, We've had Scott on the, on the Cube before. He's sure, sure, Scott's great. great. He, want, he wants Pure to be a winner. Scott's got a good product. Yeah. Uh, but there's probably room for a couple, a couple well, other IPOs. Okay, so let me rephrase the question then in a different way. Get, get the answer we're looking for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is it, are, are all the bets made? I mean, all the best ventures in my experience yeah. in, observ in observating what happens is the ones that no one sees coming. Right? Yeah. If it's a category, oh, we're going to invest in Flash, okay, it's maybe a little bubbly, we'll see. But are the bets all made right now, I mean, in ent enterprise? We're seeing here, it's cloud, we know what that means. Yeah. You mentioned private, public, yeah. looking at that, yeah. like a dog or a cat, depending on how you look at it. Um, but all the, are all the bets made? You're seeing you know, acceleration, a lot of stuff under the hood, yeah. and then you got the app market. Is there a missing area that you see that no one's talking about? I, I, so, I don't, if all the bets were made, then I, I've taken the wrong job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think we're at the wrong place. So clearly, if you look at the startups down on, on the expo floor or all the companies in this space, the, the, the bets are far from being made, right? So I think we're actually seeing the beginning of a new wave of you know, franchise companies, right? This whole post-server generation of cloud companies will create the next VMware, the next Microsoft, the next Oracles. Um, so I'm actually bullish, which is why, why I'm at Greylock, because I want to you know, participate by being an investor in this generation. So to your point, John, is okay, not all the bets are made, so where are the white spaces? Um, so I look up and down the stack, specifically on storage, I think we're still early. So I think we're just seeing what Flash and Solid State is going to do to storage and application architectures. If you, just, if you talk to any of the folks that are close to the hardware design around PCIe, uh, NVM Express, kind of these new standards around you know, um, computer interfaces, yeah. that's going to change what you think about the storage architecture. Uh, then I think when you go one level up from the storage architecture, I'm really bullish about this next generation of applications, right? So it's not just mobile or scale out, is all of a sudden you have uh, data that's massive in size with, uh, that's 
at your fingertips as an application or as a user. So you think about applying uh, new algorithms or new technologies to bring this data to bear, you can build next-gen apps that are better um, customer-facing experiences, better e-commerce experiences, better personal experiences, like you know, you know, things from like you know, personal search around my own technology, my own data, my own photos, or, or enterprise. So search. that potential to change the whole application, you know, delivery model, development model—that's a big, big revenue hit, huge value proposition. So let me ask, let me ask John's question a different way. This. This, you know, the, the bubble around you know, one point, tier 1.5 storage, the three parts, the sure. ecologics, the compellence, do you feel like this flash wave will be you know, substantially larger than that? You know, it's always hard to say where we're sitting now, but I do believe this flash wave is going to be more, bigger and more disruptive in that I mean, generation. Based on what you just said, I it would have thought you'd be. say, of course. Because you've got a combination yeah. of both the cost yeah. of the technology <laughs> combined with of this next generation of applications and we're data. Getting a huge market. We're getting a, a lot of questions market. in on Twitter. You're getting a good crowd on Twitter. <laughs> so the, uh, the one question is, how commoditized is storage? Come on, Jerry, answer. <laughs> That's Jim Lundy, so ex-gardener analyst. Jim, good question. <laughs> Shout out to Jim. Uh, so <laughs> storage, is, as you know, Jim, is what? $40 billion, $50 billion market. So and there's a chunk of the storage market. It's not go, it's shrinking, it's right. growing, right? There's a, so <laughs> I think you, you got to tear out the storage, right? So I think there's, just like tape became commodity, I think a lot of, kind of the, the disk array vendors and the disk technologies will become less interesting. And that the innovation around performing flash and solid state uh, is where the action is now. I think it's where we're going to be for the next few years. So companies like Pure Storage that have kind of value add around that, that layer is definitely far from commodity, right? Yeah. If you look what Pure is doing with flash, there's, there's nothing close, right? In, in our minds, and you can say I'm biased, but then you look um, at the layer below and some of the older disk technologies, yeah, they're, they's getting long in the tooth for obvious reasons. This technology has been around for a while. Not quite as long as your, your Seagate hard drive or Winchester hard drive, but yeah. long enough. Yeah, my impression, yeah. I mean, my impression is, is that there's going to be a massive, the ball's going to be moving down the field very fast and I, in an yeah. area that no one's going to see yet. So this is again my speculation, my opinion, but when talking to David Flynn, who prior to him leaving Fusion IO, yep. he talks about Flash as a memory resource, not sure. a disk resource. If you take that mindset, that opens up basically a completely new market, that's apps, right? Whole nother app tier. And yeah, that's what you were saying you know. before. I mean, that whole NVMe, and right? Yeah, With I think. With PCIe so and NVMe, exactly. When you use solid state, treat it like memory, or you think of a memory, what happens to my application, my data, my app architecture, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, so I think this is exciting. And what I'm impressed about Greylock is, and just a little plug for Greylock, I mean, you have no agenda there, not funded by you guys at all, um, or looking for funding, although I know <laughs> my neighbor, Michael Callahan's great guy, uh, EIR over there, but your reputation is good, but you're done, your deals on the consumer consumer side are sure. all self-built hyperscales. A lot of the big successes are have lived through sure. what a lot of enterprises are trying to do. Sure. So you guys have a unique perspective of this, so I think that's going to be very positive. But I got to ask you about your investment thesis around uh, the, the entrepreneurs these days. So I always get in trouble on Twitter when I say the kids don't want to install Linux patches anymore. <laughs> they want automation, which is true. Yeah. The, the new generation, if you will. Um, but there's a lot of new entrepreneurs under the age of 30 getting into the enterprise space because it's sexy now. Now you're seeing all the mainstream blogs cover the enterprise. So the question is, does experience matter in the enterprise? And are there enterprise plays that don't require that legacy experience of channels, sales, with SaaS? Um, you know, you're seeing guys going to Y Combinator, yep. or they're doing these you know, your discovery deals at Greylock. Yep. There are young guys out there, the new, the new, the new blood, if you will. So I think it's a combination. For sure, there'll be a, a bunch of enterprise companies coming out from when you say the young blood that has have less enterprise experience, right? But I think as those things grow up, like Cloudera came out from um, four co-founders, three of which were like Facebook or Google, and Mike Olson, which was kind of a more of a seasoned enterprise hand, that was a great meshing of, of old and new to kind of build this great you know, enterprise software company. So I think a lot of the great ideas, technologies are going to come from this generation because they're, they're solving problems in a, a more creative way. But ultimately I think as they grow up, you got to solve what problems am I trying to solve? And the closer you are to the problem, right? If you understand the enterprise buyer's pain point, that's going to help you um, sell the product. Either identify a message, a value proposition, or even figure out how much is this worth? How much do you charge for it? Because it's not really a, a freemium ad model really in the enterprise. So understanding how much of a, of a pain point is this and how much value can I create and, and, and charge for, uh, a lot of that comes from a combination of new technology and enterprise experience. And so a lot of our enterprise entrepreneurs are folks that have come from industry, like a, a VMware or a, a EMC or PeopleSoft or um, a BA, 
that can take that knowledge of an enterprise pain point and combine that with a new technology trend. And so that merging of new technology with a known enterprise pain point is where you get this kind of hyperscale adoption. Mm -hmm. We're here at Jerry Chen, I'm getting short on time. I want to thank you for coming in. Obviously, great to have uh, you on with your experience at VMware. You've been to all 10 VMworlds. Obviously, it's a VMware uh, you know, veteran, uh, now general partner at one of the best uh, VC firms in Silicon Valley and on, in Boston. Uh, um, so I got to ask you the final question, sure. kind of tying both those two worlds together is, um, you're looking at deals, you guys aren't afraid to invest big money, pay up valuation for the winners, and look at new startups. What is, and what, what level of disruption is the software-defined data center going to do for IT and the enterprise? Obviously, without businesses, no yeah. consumers don't have jobs. Without jobs, they can't buy stuff on the web. So <laughs> you gotta, there is a business market that's viable, so that's obvious. But how much change is coming on the enterprise side? If software-defined data center tracks the way people think yep. it's going to track, or maybe with some upward trajectory or, or flatter trajectory, still change. Yeah. How much more is it going to change, and what do you think the impact's going to be? So I've been, I've been talking to um, entrepreneurs about this, this post-server world, this post-server thesis, which in my mind means $150 billion of IT spend in the enterprise is up for grabs, which means like every incumbent, from the database vendors, the hardware vendors, the storage vendors, they're all at risk of being disrupted, by this post-server trend. So I think, John and David, that uh, all those technology players are up for disruption. I think it's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs. Um, I'm excited, I, you know, I'm still bullish on a bunch of the companies here, VMware included, but I'm really bullish, really excited about seeing you know, the next VMware's out there. And, um, Oh, that's that's what well, we're off to the races the next, to find out. And Joe Tucci's looking for the next VMware <laughs> too. <laughs> or everyone else, the next Joe Tucci. Yeah. We totally agree, the core IT market's just the tip of the iceberg. More business people are building apps. Yeah. IT is going to just be continue to grow, but change, so. Correct. Jerry Chen, enterprise uh, general partner at Greylock Venture Capital in Boston in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, known within the within great circles of entrepreneurs. You look at all the most successful deals there in them and uh, got a great pipeline. Thanks for coming on the queue. Always great to get thanks your perspective with a guy with the checkbook. Uh, so thanks for coming in and, and sharing your knowledge inside the queue. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>